First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Have you ever been overconfident in something and, and end up losing or, or getting beat uh, at something because you just, you know how amazing you are? Uh, you know your strengths and your abilities, and so you don't even train for it. You just know, I, I got this. Uh, overconfidence is when we believe our abilities are better than they really are. Um, it causes us to believe that we're sufficient um, in our abilities and that we no longer really need to, to train seriously uh, or hard. Um, you Rocky fans, you remember that it was overconfidence that caused him to lose to Mr. T. Um, he just, he didn't take anything serious. I've been doing this for so long. I've fought so many guys. I, you know, I know what I'm doing. And, uh, and uh, in his overconfidence, he got beat. Um, overconfidence causes us to, to drop our guard. Uh, it causes us to drop our discipline. Not that we completely give up, but it's like, I don't have to do that much anymore. I've been doing this for a while. I, I know what I'm doing. I've faced things and dealt with things and conquered things and defeated things. And so I don't have to work as hard at it because I'm, I'm mature now and I've grown now and I understand more. And so we can, in that overconfidence, drop our guard and not see things coming and, and not be aware or not recognize them as being dangerous. And, and when things do hit us, we're not, we're not physically capable or, or spiritually, I should say, capable of dealing with them because we haven't been practicing, we haven't been focusing, we haven't been reading, we haven't been committing, we haven't been who we truly are in Christ. And so when something comes at us, we find ourselves, you know, thinking we're going to go out and have a victory, but when we stand up, we collapse. We just don't have the strength or the abilities, uh, and we find ourselves defeated. And that, that again, can come through our overconfidence. This is where Paul takes us today in, in, in chapter 10. Um, last time he talked about our Christian, taking our Christianity serious. Uh, Paul compared it to running a race. And, and he says, listen, and if we're all in this race, which we are, he says, run to win. Don't run with that, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. I know I'm not going to win, but, you know, I'm going to give it a try. He says, no, run to win. You know, take our Christianity that serious. Uh, in order to win, you have to train. You have to train hard. And Paul told us in, in chapter 9, he said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul was not confident, confident in who he was. Okay, he was an apostle. He was a servant of the Lord. Um, he was a great evangelist. He was a church planner. He had planted many churches. He was a teacher of God's word. And yet he fought against his flesh. He, he, he tells us in Philippians that we should have no confidence in our flesh. And you would think Paul would. Now, Paul there in, Corinth, um, in Philippians does say, I could have, and he went through his Jewish history, but... Even in the gospel, Paul had traveled all over the place, planted many churches, preached Christ everywhere. In fact, his heart was, I want to find places where Christ hasn't been preached so that I can preach to people who have never heard about Christ. But he never was confident in himself. He never looked at himself and said, I am very successful. I am I kind of amaze myself at times, the places I've been, the things I've gone through and stood through it all. He says, no, I beat my flesh all the time. I beat myself down. I have no confidence in my flesh. And so Paul has warned that we should be focusing on taking our Christianity serious. And now it's almost like he addresses anyone who has been maybe walking with the Lord for a number of years or has, has had some really deep, hard trials and seeing God lift them up and bring them through 
difficult, horrible situations. And therefore, they're just kind of like, wow, I, I am a good Christian. I am amazing. And, and he seems to now address that danger of being overconfident and dropping our guard in disciplining our flesh and fighting against our flesh. That is very real on a day-to-day basis. So let's read the first part of our text, uh, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse one. He says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Father, as we open your word today, Father, it is our desire to grow. It is our desire to understand. It is our desire to take your word as, as our very purpose and our goal and our direction in our lives, Father, knowing that through your word, you teach us and encourage us. And so, Father, bless this time as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, Paul uses Israel's history um, as his example, um, back when they were delivered from bondage in Egypt and went through the wilderness on their way to the promised land that God had promised them. Our text says that all were under the cloud, meaning they were all, everyone, all of them were under the leading and the guidance of God. They weren't some of them, they were all under the leading and the guidance of God. He says they all passed through the sea, showing that all were delivered by the Lord from the bondage of Egypt, and also from, they were delivered from the Egyptian army that was pursuing after them, that God had delivered them. Uh, they all crossed through to the new life, void of bondage, uh, void of fear. When they when they left Egypt, you guys, and went and crossed the Red Sea, they, they left that bondage and that fear of the army and, and the attacks. They left it behind, and now they're, they're in a new life. They're, they're, they're walking into this new life that God was providing for them. They all, he says, they all passed through the sea. They all saw the hand of God, the deliverance of God from bondage and from the pursuing army. He says they all were baptized into Moses, uh, into the cloud and into the sea. They did this by following Moses. Okay, they, they followed Moses. They, knowing that Moses and accepting that Moses was led by the Lord through the cloud and through the sea, they put themselves under the leadership of Moses who was sent by the Lord to lead and to, to, to deliver them. They trusted, they trusted the man that the Lord had sent to deliver them and lead them. Now when Moses was first introduced, no, they mocked and laughed and didn't accept him. But as they saw God using him and as they saw God leading, they all accepted and followed the man that God had sent to deliver them. It says that all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual water. This is referring to the manna that God provided every morning for them to eat and for the water that God had provided through the rock. You know, that just Moses struck the rock and out came water. Okay, and so they all ate of that manna. They all drank from that. This tells us that they were all provided for by God. They're in the desert, you guys. They're out in the wilderness. What are we going to eat? And there was a minimum of a million people. What are we going to eat? Where is enough water for day by day? And we're moving around. And God provided. And, and so this is talking about how they were all provided for by God. And I, and I love, just a side note here, I love how Paul ties in Jesus into the Old Testament whenever he, he can. He mentions the rock. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is that rock, okay? And then he just goes on from there. He just wanted you to know that Jesus was not 
introduced and thought of and began in the New Testament, he's back here in the Old Testament too. And so as he, he mentions the rock, he's just like, oh, and by the way, Jesus, Jesus is that rock. Okay, and, and so you can see the confidence that the children of Israel would have. They were being protected by God. The, the Egyptian army, this is an army. These were chasing people who had no weapons and they, they were protected by God. They were delivered from bondage. They were under the leadership of Moses who was led and sent by God. They were fed daily by God and water was given to them daily. Who wouldn't be confident? Who wouldn't be comfortable? They were safe. They were completely taken care of by the Lord. They didn't have to do anything except for get up and, and go get the manna. Okay, they, they didn't have to do anything but go to the rock and get some water. They didn't have to fight the army coming after them. They didn't have to deliver themselves. God was their provider and deliverer and, and he took care of them and, and they were just, you know, they, didn't, they felt we're just, we're great. We're in, in great shape. Paul is comparing them to our situation in Christ as Christians. We are all under the leading and the guidance of God and have all been delivered from the bondage of sin and are all daily delivered from the pursuit of the enemy. We have all been baptized into Christ who was sent by God to deliver us and to lead us. We are all fed the spiritual bread of life who is Christ. Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 6, Beginning in verse 32, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the bread, from he the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he said to them, Lord, give us this bread. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is that bread. We all have been given that bread to eat. We've all, that is how all of us are saved. That is how all of us have life. Jesus is the rock who gives us living water. Jesus tells us in John 7, 37 to 38, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So we, just like the children of Israel, are confident in our Christianity, knowing that the Lord goes before us and provides all things for us. He defeated the enemy. He brought us out of bondage. He provides us life. He provides us the living water. He provides everything for us and guides us and takes care of us. So we can become confident in that and, and overly confident in that we don't, we just kind of lay there and just go, here I am. I don't have to read a lot. I don't have to pray. I don't have to work on my relationship with God. He loves me. He loves me so much he laid his life down for me. He's paid it all for me. He provides for me. He goes before me. I got fired. He'll give me another one. I don't even have to go look for it. He, God has my phone number. He'll give the company my phone number and, and, and call me. You know, I, we, can, we can see ourselves and he goes before us in all things. So sit back and enjoy the ride. Paul shared a warning with us, though, in verse 5, by reminding us that God was not well pleased with most of the children of Israel. And he says, and how do we know he wasn't pleased with them? They died in the wilderness. They did not go into the promised land. They were overconfident in who they were and did not discipline their bodies and bring themselves into subjection. They didn't tell themselves no. They didn't put a filter over their mouth. They didn't put a filter over their heart. They just figured, I can do anything because he is my deliverer. I can say anything, do anything, go anywhere because it's not about me. God is my deliverer. God is my supplier. I didn't give us manna. I don't bring forth water. I didn't get us out of Egypt. I didn't defeat the Egyptian army. It's all him, so 
I get to just live my life. And they were overconfident. And they weren't following God and listening to God. Paul goes on in our text and says, their history that he just mentioned is an example and a warning of becoming overconfident in our Christianity and not disciplining our bodies and bringing our bodies into subjection. He goes on in our text and he gives us five things the children of Israel neglected to discipline in their life. The suggestion obviously being don't neglect these particular things, though there's others, but he mentions five things that we should not neglect, that we can become overconfident in and therefore not exercise and not discipline our walk with God in these particular things. Let's read 1 Corinthians 10 beginning in verse 6. He says, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in, and in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So he he says these were five things that they they just didn't work on. They just didn't see the necessity. They weren't careful about it. They weren't guarding against it. They weren't fighting against it. And the first thing was, he says, listen, they did not lust. They did not protect against lusting after evil things. And so Paul says, so don't lust after evil things. Lust means to become overwhelmed with the craving for something. Just the the desire for it, the craving for it consumes you. And it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. You're just, you're consumed with the craving for it. Israel's lust is shared with us in the the book of Numbers, chapter 11, beginning in verse 4. It says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them, the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, a lot of Egyptians went with them. And it says, So now this mixed multitude that were among them yielded to the intense cravings. The, the, The mixed multitude, the Egyptians, yielded. They saw no need not to do whatever they wanted. And it says, so the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, ah, the melons, the leeks, the onions, oh, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. as, As the Egyptians were like complaining, like, really? Day after day, it's manna. So what's for breakfast tomorrow? Manna. What's for lunch tomorrow? Manna. How about dinner? You guessed it. Manna. We're going to change the menu tomorrow? No. And they're like, oh, man, I can remember. The Egyptians were talking about, man, I remember how we used to eat. Okay, and the, 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 the melons and, and, and the fish and, and the meat and, oh, and the seasonings. Oh, I love that garlic and, and, and just, and, and then Israel's going, yeah, yeah, I miss that too. I'm kind of tired of manna. And, and, and so they, they find themselves, I want that too. I prefer that. You know, and that was their complaint. They were lusting for the things from their past when they were in bondage. They were, they were forgetting about bondage now. You remember Egypt? Yeah, I remember this, the meat and the fish and the melons and the garlic. Do you remember the bondage? No, but I remember the meat and the fish and the melons and, and the garlic. And, but you were in bondage. Yeah, yeah but we had meat. And, you know, and so that's all they were focused on. And that's what they began to lust for. They were lusting for the things that they had left behind in the world. And this is sometimes th- th- something that threatens Christians, that we're overwhelmed craving for the things that we left behind in the world. 
and, and, and we, we focus on it. And, and just like the children of Israel, often what causes for this lusting is, is our association with the mixed multitude that talks about their enjoyment. Oh man, last night we did this and we did that. Oh man, we, we went over here and they're talking about these things and you're beginning to think, oh, I remember we used to do that. I used to do that. And that was a lot of fun. I, I, yeah. And we began to think about it and we lose sight of, but don't forget, you were in bondage. And, and this is where Israel was. They, the children of Israel, they were lusting and Paul says they didn't, they didn't even fight against it. They didn't even consider, you know what? Yeah. And I got to agree with him, you know, don't forget, folks, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, so we're not talking about, you know, two weeks of manna. We're talking 40 years. Okay, so I understand that, you know, I, I would miss, you know, I, I every now and then I'll go on a day diet. And, and, and in that one day, I'm thinking of the things that I wish to, I remember when I used to eat that. And it's like, it was just two days ago, man. Get over yourself. You know? But so, but they, what they did is they didn't discipline themselves. They didn't go, yeah, but remember what it cost us? Remember what we paid for that? Remember how our lives were? Remember what we were going through? Remember the bondage that we were under? No, I'm just focusing on the fish, man, and the garlic. And, and so they didn't. We don't. We can sometimes put ourselves in that place to where, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, sometimes it bothers me when I watch people give their testimonies and when they're talking about their sinful life, man, they are pumped. And they're just jazzed and they just got all these ways of describing and everybody, yeah, the whole audience is laughing. And then I accepted Jesus and now I'm saved. <laughs> and that's it. And it's like, wow, your previous life sounds so much better than your new life. You know, and, and they don't emphasize the glory of walking in Christ and the deliverance from the bondage. And they, they just, you know, they weren't, they weren't exercised. They knew where they came from. So Paul says, listen, you guys, yeah, sometimes things in the world were fun or tasty, but don't forget what you paid. Don't forget where you were. Discipline yourself against these less because those are all the enemy trying to pull you away from God. He says, so don't, don't allow yourself to be pulled into that. He says that we are not to become idolaters. He's referring to the time that the children of Israel had asked Aaron to make them a God because Moses was taking too long to return. And so remember Aaron then formed this golden calf and they began to worship. Okay, they have been delivered from bondage. They have crossed the Red Sea on dry land and watched the Egyptian army drown behind them. They have watched God provide food for them. They have watched God give them water. And now they're worshiping a golden calf that was just made this morning. That's what delivered it. It just got here. Okay, it didn't deliver you from Egypt. It didn't take you across the Red Sea. It hasn't been feeding you and giving you. It just got here this morning. And they were worshiping it. Exodus 32, 6, chapter 32, verse 6 says, Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. The word play there in the Hebrew means to mock. They were mocking God. This is what delivered us. Not you. This is what has brought us where we are. Listen, when we place things before the Lord, we are placing them above the Lord, which means that we prefer them over the Lord, which is mocking him. Because God is the one that provides for us. God is the one that goes before us. God is the one that has given us deliverance. Nothing else. And so when we look to other things and say that these are what bring me satisfaction, these are what you know, has delivered me, and they become our idols, then we're mocking God. 
Paul says, let nothing be put before the Lord. Discipline yourself against it. And there will always be temptation. Discipline yourself against it. He goes on and says, do not commit sexual immorality. This is referring to when Balaam was, was, gave counsel to the king of Moab, the children of Israel, wherever they are going, were conquering anybody that messed with them. So the king of, of Moab hired Balaam to come and to prophesy against the children of Israel. And when he first sent his servants, Balaam said, I can't do that. I can only, I'm, I'm a prophet of God. I'm not gonna, that's his people. I can't prophesy against them. And, and he kept sending them and kept opening the hand. Well, we'll pay you this much. Okay, we'll double that. Okay, we'll triple that. You know, and then, and so Balaam kept coming to God going, so, oh, well, money. Okay, can I? And God, no. And eventually God said, okay, because Balaam just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And God said, okay, fine, fine. You can go, but you can only say what I tell you to say. All right. How cool is that? I get to go preach and I get paid big bucks. So when he stood up over the children of Israel, he didn't curse them. He blessed them because he could only say the words of God. Now, on his way, he was maybe thinking, hey, so like, what's God going to do? And remember God spoke to the donkey, and then the donkey spoke to Balaam? I don't know about you guys, but if a donkey ever spoke to me, I'd listen. Okay, <laughs> but, but, but God told the donkey to warn him, make sure you don't say what you want to say or what they want. Make sure that you say only what I tell you to say. So he gets up there and he prophes and he blesses Israel. And the king of Moab was not impressed. Okay, it was just like, I didn't bring you here to bless them. I brought you here to curse them. And Balaam said, I couldn't. I told you, I can't. These are God's people. But, he could, but, I, but I, I do have an idea for you, okay? Bring your women into and introduce them to the men of Israel. Because God says they are not to have relationships with any other woman, just, just the Israeli women. So bring your women in. He was so confident, this is sad for us guys, that the guys could not resist these Moab women. So it was like a sure deal. And it happened. Just as he said, Moab women were brought into the camp of Israel. The guys said, woo! And they started having relationships with him and it was against the very word of God. And so the, what happened to them, we read in Numbers 25, beginning in verse one, it says, now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to the Moab gods. And so Israel joined ba Baal and Peor, and the anger of the Lord arose against them. So, sexual immorality has always been a problem in the world. Our society, there's no exception. So, we have to discipline ourselves. We have to discipline ourselves. We can't have somebody, have somebody dress a certain seductive way and go, look at that, look how disgusting that is. They shouldn't be allowed. God, just look away. Oh, I'm, oh I have to turn my head? Yes. Oh, well, they should be in trouble. Look at how they're dressed. And they should be the ones that turn your head away. That's self-discipline. That's look, whoa, and turning away. Okay? This is discipline. This is what he's saying. Listen, stay away from sexual immorality. I'm so thankful that, that there was a movement a number of years ago, uh, preferably they don't change it, but remember when you used to go to a, a store and, and all of the, the dirty magazines were right there in the very front? Well, they made them now put them in the back. This was done years ago. We had a moral moment in, in America, okay? And they put them behind the counter because they understand just the sight, just the look, just that'll get you thinking. And then if you're old enough, once you get to thinking, then you get to buying. And, and so that's, that's what they were going after. Say, nothing less than what Balaam told them. Get the women in there. You know, well, they know the law. Yeah, show them the girls. They'll forget the law. And, and, they, and they won't tell themselves, no. They won't tell them, get out of here. They won't tell them, go away. They'll just look at them and go, you, sh you shouldn't be here. Okay, this is wrong. You, you, should, you should go away after I buy you lunch. 
okay? Uh, and, and it just, so he says, discipline yourself. You turn your head. You walk away. You, when those thoughts pop into your head, you rebuke them. You, oh, no, 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 no. Give me the Bible. Start worshiping. Read some scriptures. He's telling you, discipline yourself. There's this mentality that these people who are really into sports don't like to eat what we eat. Yes, they do. They love the candies and the treats and, and everything else. It's not like they, you know, yeah, no, I've, I've never liked candy. No. They like the sweets, they like the, the, the bad things that we eat, but they discipline themselves because they have a goal in mind and, and, a, and a prize in mind. And so Paul says, listen, don't commit sexual immorality. Discipline yourself. You do the discipline. Don't blame the, the magazines or the world or the, the people dressed seductively. You discipline yourself. You do the work. He says, and don't, do not tempt Christ. This situation is described in Numbers chapter 21 for the children of Israel. Chapter 21 of Numbers, beginning in verse 5. He says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. They were questioning God. You obviously don't know what you're doing. You obviously don't have a handle on this. You obviously don't have things as in order as you said we did, because we're missing stuff. We're longing for stuff. They were tempting and questioning God. You're not doing it right. You're not, this isn't how it should be done. And they were challenging God and tempting God. And we can do that when we do not believe his word, when we do not trust the word of God. When God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, well, I sure don't feel you. I sure don't see you. I sure don't think this is right. I sure don't think this is the path I should go down. And they were questioning and challenging very similar to the last thing that Paul says, and he says, and don't complain. Don't complain about what's unfolding in your lives. The Lord had brought the children of Israel to the very banks of the, of the Jordan River. Across the Jordan River, that was the promised land that God had promised them. That's it, folks. Our journey's over. We're crossing over to that land right there. Send 12 guys over there to see if it's really what God says it is. And those 12 guys came back and they described it exactly as God did. God kept telling the children of Israel, the promised land is a land filled with milk and honey. So when they came back, they said, truly a land filled with milk and honey means prosperous and enjoyable. And they even brought some of the fruit, but the fruit was so big they carried it between two guys on a pole. They didn't just pull out a little thing of grapes. They were carrying stuff on poles. It's exactly as God has said. And you can see the excitement rising. All right, and it's right there. But, 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 there's giants in the land. Big old guys, a lot taller than us. Trained army, know what they're doing. We have no ability. We look like grasshoppers compared to these guys. Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen a grasshopper. Uh, my thing now with my grandson is don't step on bugs, okay? Because uh, that's his thing. Oh, you know, oh man. You know. <laughs> but that's grasshoppers compared to giants. They'll just step on us. It would be nice. It could be nice. But look at, look at what's in our way. Things that we can't compete against. We can't. We can't do this. It's just too much. And their, their hope and their joy and their excitement just oh, right out their feet. And it, it was just, I don't want to go. Uh, look, at, look at Numbers 14, beginning in verse 1. So all of the congregation lifted up their voices 
and cried and the people wept that night all night they're just weeping and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them if only we had died in the land of Egypt or, or if if only we had died in the wilderness why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And so they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. We ain't going. We ain't crossing this river. We're not going over there. I, I would rather die in Egypt. I would rather die in the wilderness. I want a new leader. I'm going back. I'm not doing this. And look at God's response in Numbers 14, beginning in verse 28. God tells Moses, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you, uh, of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number for 20 years old and above. I would rather die in the wilderness. God says, all right then you have your wish. You don't have to go to the promised land. You don't have to go over there in the land that I've promised and have blessed. You want to die in the wilderness? Let's go. Turned them around and they wandered for 40 years until they were all the 20 years and older died in the wilderness. And then the younger ones were allowed, you know, the young ones now being 60, okay, <laughs> were now the ones going across to the river. They were complaining because it was going too hard. This isn't what I want. You know, you promised me a beautiful life. You promised me paradise. You promised me milk and honey. You promised me, you know, fruit and, 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 and everything else. And God said, and what did they tell you? They said, it's true, just like you said. But you didn't tell us about the giants. You didn't tell us about the war. You didn't tell us about the trials. But God did tell them, don't be afraid of them. I will deliver you. Yeah, but you didn't tell us they were giants. Okay? You left some stuff out as if anything would be difficult for our God. But they began to complain. They didn't like the way that God was fulfilling his scriptures, his promises. Thank you for fulfilling your promise. Thank you for delivering us from Egypt. Thank you for getting us across the Red Sea. Thank you for providing food and water. Thank you for letting us see the promised land. But you're not doing this right. If I were in charge, I would just wipe them out before we even got here. Okay, that's how I think you should do it. Have you ever caught yourself complaining to the Lord that things are too hard? Or you don't feel he's doing it right? You know, I, I don't, I don't, I can't do this. I, I you know, I, I be not able. The children of Israel cried to Moses, was, we're not able to do this. Have you ever found yourself in that position to where God, I'm not able, I can't, no way. It, it, you know, I, I followed you and you promised and it sort of looks good, but I didn't know this. So you didn't tell me about the giants. You didn't tell me about the trials. I know, I know, Jesus said in this world you shall have tribulation, but he didn't specifically say this, okay? I didn't know I was gonna have to face this, okay? And, and I, you know, and, and we just find ourselves complaining because it's not quite how we envisioned it, definitely not how we think it should be done, and we just find ourselves complaining, and yet we have the promises of God also. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do some things? No, 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 I can do all things things through Christ who strengthens me. I can get through this. Do I want to? No, not really. But I can get through it. I have the promise of God. And the amazing thing is we learn so much, so much as we go through things. We can look back at our trials and go, did not like that. Was not fun. Don't ever want to go back there again. But I love where I am in Christ now and what I've learned and how he's strengthened me and how my mind has changed and how my heart has improved because of that. I don't want to do that again, but I, I'm thankful on this side. The children of Israel 
God's promise was, don't worry about them. They're giants. What do you mean don't worry about them? I got this. How? Don't worry about it. Trust me. I'll show you. You'll, you'll see my power. You'll see my might. You'll see my wisdom. You'll see the way I do things. You'll watch me go before you. You'll watch me provide. You'll see all of this right there in front of you. Just follow. So Paul says, listen, you guys, don't complain because you don't think he's doing it right. Don't complain because it's hard. Don't complain to the things in our life. Focus on Christ. He has promised that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Stand on that. Amen. Don't look at anything and go, but it's a giant. Don't focus on that. So Paul says, these are five things that we must not neglect in our walk with the Lord ever. I don't care how many years we've been walking or you've been walking with the Lord. Do not neglect these things in our lives. Don't lust after evil things. Do not become an idolater. Do not commit sexual immorality. Do not tempt Christ. Do not complain. Always, always discipline our bodies, your body, against these things. Tell yourself no. Tell yourself yes for the things of the Lord. Quickly now, Paul makes this personal as he gives the application. Look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition or our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourself what I say. Little notes right there. God will make a way of escape that you may get out of it? No, that you may be able to bear it. He never promised that you wouldn't go through it but he says he will enable us to bear it. These things that we just went through in the children of Israel were written to encourage us, to instruct us, letting us know that we all, all of us face struggles and temptations and fears. We are not the only one being tempted. It is sometimes common to think that I'm the only one that struggles with this. I'm the only one that gets hit like this. I'm the only one that goes through these trials. How come everybody else has a grand old time? How you do? Oh, I love Jesus. You know, how are your kids? Oh, my kids are all serving Jesus. And yours? Let's talk about your kids if they're all serving Jesus. Okay, let's not talk about my kids. Okay? Uh, I'm the only one. And I, I serve you with my whole life. And I face these trials, and I face those trials, and how come I got sick? How come I lost my job? And, and, and we always can put ourselves in that position as far as I'm the only one that God really doesn't care about. I'm the only one that God just, like, I'm busy, and he takes care of everybody else. Paul says, no, we all face struggles and temptations. We all face fears. There's no exceptions. My struggles may be different than yours. Your fears may be different than mine. My temptations may be different than your temptations, but we all face these things, Paul. So you almost hear Paul say, so come on, quit whining, okay? We were told that our enemy is gonna oppose us. We were told that Satan's gonna come hard after us if we turn from the ways of him and the world. Because if we don't worry about it, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll enable you to get through it. God is always faithful, he tells us. He says we must trust and believe that we will not, he will not give us more than we can handle. He will make a way of escape through the things that we go through. 
I don't know if you've ever quoted this scripture to somebody who's struggling. If you do, right after you quote it, duck. Okay? Because when people are going through a hard time, you go, you know, sister, you know, brother, God will never give us more than we can handle. Duck. All right? Because that's the last scripture they want to hear. Okay? Because they just believe it to be in, insensitive. But it's not. And I, I don't know that I'd always recommend you leading with that scripture. Okay? But it's true. It's an absolute truthful scripture. God is always faithful. How do I know that? We're all still here. Everything that we've gone through, we're all still here. So what would, he got us through it. As I said earlier, I don't want to go through some of the things I've gone through ever again. I can always hear God telling me, well, then don't do what you did before, okay? And you won't go through that again. But, so this is what Paul is saying. Come on. Yeah, it's tough. I understand. I mean, the people he's writing to, the Corinthians and us, we haven't even gotten close to the things that Paul went through. And he doesn't complain. I mean, come on, God, look what I do for you. You know, can you just... Can I not get beaten this time? Can I not go to jail this time? Can I not be stoned this time? I mean, come on, cut me some breaks here. But he never complains. And he tells him, oh, don't worry about me. I'm having a grand old time in prison in Rome. I'm preaching Jesus everywhere. That's a whole different heart. Because he understood, I'll get through this. Now, when Paul was later imprisoned in Rome, he knew. He's not coming out. And he tells Timothy, yeah, I'm not coming out this time. I'm going to die in prison this time. And he was. Nero beheaded Paul. But God had prepared him for that. You're not going this time, Paul. All right. And Paul, I'm thinking Paul's going, good, because I'm tired. Okay? I, I, I could use heaven right about now. Okay? But so he, warned, he tells them and us, listen, we're not in this alone. So, so he, he, he tells us in verse 12, he says, basically, he says, so don't get overconfident in who you think you are, lest you fall. He's telling us, never stop disciplining your body to bring it into subjection. Never stop reading the Bible. Never stop praying. Never stop fellowshipping with Christians. Never stop telling your flesh no. Why? Because Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. That never goes away. Our flesh never gives up. Our flesh lusts and comes against our spirit every day. So you can't stop training, you guys. You can't stop disciplining and, and I love the way Paul closes in verse 17. Basically, he's saying, come on, you guys. You're smart. You know all this is true. I, I like the Amplified Bible version of, of, of verse 15. It says, I am speaking to intelligent, sensible people. Think over and make up your minds for yourself about what I say. I appeal to your reason and your discernment in this matter. It's, again, it's like Paul saying, come on, you guys are smart. You know, you know what I'm sharing with you is true. You've lived it. So into the discipline. We have to be honest with ourselves, you guys, about our relationship with the Lord, about our walk with the Lord. Our walk with the Lord is such a gift from God. It's such a gift from God. And the joy of walking with him is, is so comforting. But if we don't put effort into our relationship with him, we'll grow weak and fall to temptation and we'll fall to trials in our lives because we're just not preparing ourselves for the things that we know are gonna come. We have to continue to build on our relationship with the Lord no matter what comes our way, no matter what we face. Just keep working on it. Jeanette and I have been married for 110 years, okay? And it only feels like 51. See how I pulled that back in? And, but I, I don't get to say, we've been doing this so long, got it, handling it, 
good with it. Oh, heavens no. I, I'm still a, a work in progress. And Jeanette still looks at me and goes, 51 years and you're still not there? Are you serious? N always, always work on your relationship with the Lord. Don't be distracted by anything, you guys. Spiritual things are happening in our world today, all over the world. The Lord is organizing and arranging things for the last days. So stay alert. Be watchful. Stay focused. Don't believe or be convinced or allow yourself to think we're in the final cruising stage. We're going downhill. I don't even have to give a gas anymore. I just have to steer this thing. Oh, I give, I give it to Jesus. Jesus, take the wheel. Okay? But I don't have to do what I did to get here. I'm on the cruising phase. I'm on the relaxing phase. No, that's what the enemy is trying to tell us. And that way we're not alert. And that way we're not watchful. And that way we're not focused. We're just cruising. Are you here yet? Are you here yet? And we're vulnerable. Remember, Jesus' final words to his church, which is us, in the book of Revelations, are surely I am coming quickly. So he warns, the last thing he said to the church, surely I am coming quickly. And people have challenged that. I don't think quickly means 2,000 years. Oh, sure it does. Because 1,000 years is as a day to the Lord and a day is 1,000 years. He's not bound by a clock. And so it's real. And Jesus is preparing things. We are watching this world be arranged and rearranged to a whole world that we've never seen before. We're watching people rise to power who we for years tried to keep out of power. We're watching nations gain control that we've tried to keep them out of control of. We're watching nations who were in control giving up and cruising. I don't want to do that no more. I'm tired of being a cop. I just want to cruise and enjoy my wealth. Everything is changing. We're watching the gospel hit our nation and the world in ways that we've never seen before. The Jesus Revolution movie, if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it, but it's stirring things up. The, the prayer in Kentucky, that two week long prayer, I mean a worship service, and, and it's continuing, continuing to other places. There's another movie coming out next next Sunday for a week with Andrea Pacelli, that, that tenor that, that sings. He, TBN got together with him and they, they're producing this movie and it's hitting the theaters and it's in all of our local theaters and, and it's, it's about singing and, 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 and worship. And it's going public for a whole week. I checked the theater by my house, yep. It starts Sunday the 2nd at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock. And the plea is, listen, if enough people go, it'll go past the week. Because the theaters are all into money. If they're making money off of this movie and it's only scheduled for a week and they've made money, I'll schedule it another week and make more money. Okay, and so, but we're just watching all of this unfold. Why? Because God is arranging things, stirring things, touching hearts and lives. This is not the time to relax. This is the time to stay alert and to be watchful. This is the time that we should answer how John answered when Jesus says, surely I am coming quickly. We all need to have the same response as John. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together today and allowing us, Father, to see the the deceptions and the lies and the tactics of the enemy and trying to pull us away from the life that we have in Christ, trying to pull us away from the promises and trying to cause us to question and doubt and complain about the promises of our God, complain about how you do things, challenge about is it accurate or not. His, his tactics have worked for years. We read about how it worked against the children of Israel. We're reading about how it's worked in the, Corinth, the church in Corinth. We live it in our lives as we see it today, that he tries to pull us away and, and get us to focus on other things. 
and to complain and to challenge and to not like the way you do things. Oh, Lord, may we quickly repent and just say, Lord, I, I am so sorry. Uh, Lord, you are God. You are above all things. You have a plan. We are a part of your plan. We are in the midst of your plan. We are participating in your plan. And we want to walk day by day in your strength, knowing that you are our provider, knowing that you are our defender, knowing that you are the one that leads us. But Lord, we need to also discipline our bodies and bring it into subjection to you. We need to tell ourselves no. And we need to tell ourselves yes when it comes to walking holy and pure. We need to tell ourselves no when we're walking in the midst of the world and tell ourselves yes when we're walking towards you and in the midst of your spirit. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to be drawn into your grace and your presence. Give us that boldness and willingness, Father, to just stop all that is interfering with our walks and go towards you. May nothing distract us. May nothing challenge us. May we stand on the hope and the truth and the power and the grace and the strength of our God who has always and will always go before us and provide a way out that we may endure to the very end. So Father, strengthen us, Lord, and as we worship you now, Lord, may we just worship with our hearts and saying thank you. Lord, we pray that you would bless our offering as it is a part of our worship. We are blessed in what you've given us and, and we just want to give to you and say thank you. May our hearts be prepared knowing that as we partake in communion, it was the sacrifice of Jesus that gave us this cleansing and forgiveness. It is the resurrection of Christ that has given us the spirit and the power to walk in your strength, in your ways, for your purpose. So bless as we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's worship.